How did we get all of these people trained to fly these complicated aircraft, to fly them in combat, big high performance aircraft, to take these kids 18, 19, 20 years old out of the farms, out of the factories, out of the fish canneries, out of the universities, and turn them suddenly into combat fighter or bomber pilots. And so that's going to be our subject today. How did they do this? And how did they do that in such a very, very short period of time? It was all started by this. Here we are. Indicate it's war. And all of a sudden, this entire country is turned upside down. And let's talk about that for just a minute. I will guarantee you that anyone who is out anywhere you talk about who was of a decent age, and by that I mean maybe 9, 10 years old on up, at the time the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, can tell you exactly where he was, and everything around him. Who was with him when he first heard about the bombing of Pearl Harbor? None of us knew where Pearl Harbor was at the time. We learned very quickly. But that turned our whole world upside down. It changed everything. So the big caps here, it's war, are really the beginning of this. Immediately. We had already started somewhat of a buildup of our military services, but nothing even close to what we were about to go through. All of a sudden, we have a tremendous need for military people of every description, and in particular, the hardest of all to find good military combat pilots. So this is our story of how we're, they did that. Now, I'm going to tell this story a little bit from my own personal standpoint because I know it's a little more accurate than if I try to quote somebody else's. So please bear with me in that respect. The other thing I'll tell you about here is that I was kind of a Johnny come lately. Uh, I was called into the service on uh, April 10th of 1943. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, I was only 17 years old, so I was ineligible to go to flight training, something that I'd wanted to do since I was 13 years old. Uh, I wanted more than anything else to fly Army fighters. And finally, when this happened, I said, well, I don't know, but maybe this is my chance, and I'm not going to let it slip away if it is. But because I was just barely 17, I had to wait a while. So I went to college for just a short while, which I'm very glad I did. And during that time, I turned 18, and immediately thereafter, or shortly thereafter, I went to Portland Army Air Base and drove up to the front gate, and the, the guard at the gate says, can I help you? And I'm in my little Model A Roadster loaded with stuff home from college. And I said, yes, I want to fly your airplanes. How do I do that? And he kind of chuckled a little bit and gave me directions down to the recruiting office, which at that time was on the flight line. And I drove down there, and this zebra was sitting there with stripes all the way from his shoulder down to his wrist, and asked me the same question, and I gave him the same answer, and he kind of laughed, and he says, well, maybe I can help you. And he hands me a whole stack of papers and says, sit down, fill this out. And I did for several hours. Uh, and it asked me everything that I didn't have answers to. But I did get the basic information in, and I turned it in. And he said, uh, oh, that all looks very good. Uh, can you come back tomorrow? And I said, well, yes, of course I can. 8 o'clock the next morning, I was down there. He handed me another stack of papers. This was a written test. It took me better than three hours without a break to finish that test. I was a little bit leery about it when I turned it in. But it was time to go to lunch, and I was hungry. So I turned it in. He looked at it, went through it, and he said, congratulations, you've passed the first step. Can you come back tomorrow? And I said, yes, I can. Came back the next day, and I had a fi my physical. This physical was so complete that I spent three hours taking that physical and never stood in line one minute. It was that complete. 
I got a little worried at one point, and this is how thorough it is. I got a little worried at one point because back in those days, they didn't do all this x-ray stuff. They did some, but, but not to the extent that we have now. So one of the things they looked at was your feet. And if you remember back, those of you who are old enough, the shoe stores often had these, uh, what they called fluoroscopes in there, which you stuck your feet under, and then you could look down and see all the bones, just like an x-ray, but it didn't take a picture. What you saw was what you got. Um, looked in there, and the flight surgeon said, uh-oh, because I had a deformed big toe knuckle. I had broken that when I was a kid, and it was spread. And he said, uh, I don't know about that. I don't think we can pass that. And, of course, I was an 18-year-old punk at the time, so I, didn't, I knew enough about rank from ROTC to know what it was about. But by the same token, I had not learned any common sense either. So I blurted out, well, I tell you what, Doc, I said, I will challenge anybody in this, on this flight line to a 100-yard dash. And it got quiet in there for just a second, and he said, you know what? I think he could win. And he stamped approved on that, and three weeks later, I was at the front gate at Santa Ana to enter flight training. And that's a typical type of story that almost everybody will tell you, varieties of that, variations there from, shall we say, but basically that's it. I went home to work and got a job while I waited for him. I never wasn't, I wasn't even there long enough to pick up my first paycheck. My parents had to go down and pick it up for me because I was on the train on the way to Santa Ana. Well, when we got to Santa Ana, it was for pre-flight. Again, I'm going to emphasize that in those days, the program was changing so fast that whatever class you talked about, the training would be slightly different from the one before it or after it. And that was the case here. We were, as far as I know, the very first group that was never sent to college training detachment. We went directly into what they called classification. Now, classification was that four-week period of time when they separated out the, the cadets from, to go to pilot training, Navigator training, bombardier training, or D, none of the above. And amazingly, out of all of these people that had taken these same exams that I had, almost 40% right away fell into D, none of the above. And they went to gunnery school and who knows where. Uh, some of them went into paratroopers. Some of them had been glider pilots, and they went back to becoming glider pilots. But in that four-week period, they rooted us all out and... and when we finally came out the other end and they said I was going to pilot training, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. And away we went. So they separated us out into our proper squadrons and we started. And this is what it looked like right here. Right here, you see a couple of pictures of the cadet barracks. This is what we started in right away. Uh, the military training started the morning after we arrived, really. And we got in there late in the afternoon. And it started out with the discipline that's necessary to turn these young guys into a group of fighting people who work together. And if you look at these, the one on the it shows you the, the picture of the cadet barracks that you saw it. Take a look specifically at the floor. That floor you could eat your dinner off of at any time of night or day. That was a requirement. Look at the foot lockers up there. They're lined up exactly. And if you open the lids, you'll find that each one looks just like the last one inside. Each pair of socks had a specific point. Everything was precision right from the very first day. The another thing you might notice here in the other picture is the hanging of the uniforms and that skinny, stingy little area in which we had to hang those different uniforms and the, and the coats and whatnot. But then, you know, that was no real problem because we didn't have that many either. Because by this time, all of our civilian clothes had been shipped home and, and everything we were doing was strictly military. And if you notice, the spacing on each one of these 
is exactly the same. Did we have to measure it? Yes, we did. It was a requirement. The very, one of the very first things we had to learn to do was to march. And that sounds very simple, and believe me, it's not. Because it had to be precise. Nobody could bounce too much. Nobody could be out of step. Oh, that was a cardinal sin there. Uh, and everything was lined up perfectly. Take a look at the uh, lineup here on the, on the upper picture. And notice one thing. It, it may look like a, a, an illusion to you, but it's not. In, we always started with the front row, front rank was the tallest man in the squadron. And then on a cross and all the way back down to where the shortest guy was always the one in the back row, clear at the end. I was always somewhere near that spot. And if you look in that picture, you can't see me. This is my squadron. Uh, I was, I'm fortunate in that many of these pictures I've shown you, I found in books. And I never even knew they'd been taken, but they're of my squadron. And these are my, all my friends that I went through cadets with or at least partway through, because some of them didn't make it. And I am standing somewhere in that back row, just about in there. Uh, and then on the lower picture, you'll notice that, and let me slide this up so you can see it. On the lower picture there, gives you uh, a view of the Sunday parade that we had each Sunday afternoon at uh, the Santa Ana Army Air Base Pre-Flight School. It was a big affair. And always filled with visitors, both military and civilian, from, from the local places, watching these cadets. Uh, and one of the things that, that people never talk about, I suppose, but if you ever watched uh, the parades and happened to watch uh, George S. Patton's people, you could always see it. Perfection in marching was a real goal, and we took great pride in it. Uh, we had a, a whole myriad of subjects. One of the most important, of course, was the physical training program. <clears throat> and it was amazing how quickly they turned these people into strong, strong people from just out of nowhere. I went from 133 to 165 pounds in just a matter of 13 weeks. Uh, and there wasn't an ounce of fat on me anywhere, and I was a peanut compared with a lot of them. <clears throat> it was a very important program. We had all kinds of, of um, classwork, as I said, and this is a typical, in this particular case, they're marching in the parade, but the same thing held true as they uh, marched uh, to and from class. And we always sang as we went along. Uh, and developed a repertoire of, of a lot of good songs and some that were a little bit raunchy at times. We'd get called on those. But that was a very important, marching unified people like you can't believe. Nobody would else except military people would recognize that. <coughs> Excuse me. We had all kinds of classes. We, we studied um, uh, things, first of all, aerodynamics, what may what allows an airplane to fly, engines, basic engines, not much in particular, uh, navigation, map reading, uh, all of these different things, uh, and of course, a great deal on military customs and courtesies. And as we reached the end of the program, the end of the pre-flight, one of the last classes we took was on aviation physiology, and we took our rides in the altitude chamber. Uh, this has changed a lot since those days. Uh, one of my, my only ground job that I ever had in the service happened to be running an altitude chamber uh, as officer in charge of, at two different bases, a grand total of a little over three years doing it, <clears throat> and a job that I didn't particularly want, but once I got into it, it was pretty interesting. This is an altitude chamber here, you see. Um, I'm not sure whether this is my class or not. I don't think so. The people don't look familiar. The, in those days, the theory was that 
If you went up to altitude, and they would take us up to the equivalent of 35 to 37,000 feet in this altitude chamber, and if you got the bends, there was something physically wrong with you and you got washed out. Well, we have long since found out that that's not true at all, that everybody out there at, under the right conditions will get the bends. Uh, and uh, some people have never experienced, I never have, but that's pretty rare. Uh, maybe that's because I didn't do, in those days, in the unpressurized uh, aircraft, I didn't do that much uh, high altitude, really high altitude flying for long periods of time. But a lot of people experience those. It's a perfectly normal thing, and it's a shame that we lost some very good potential pilots uh, based upon something. But in those days, they just didn't know. Uh, this is a learning process for everybody. Um, we finally finished our pre-flight school, and it was not easy. It was, we had a terrible washout rate. Again, close to 40% of our people washed out <coughs> in pre-flight. Mostly they washed out on Morse code. Why, I'm, I'm not sure. They washed out on that and those aspects of navigation that had to do with physics. And maybe this is one of the things that helped save me was those two short terms of college because for reasons that I can't, <coughs> excuse me, that I can't explain, I went into engineering and we had a lot of physics in that. And I'm glad I did because that saved me. We went on to pre-flight and, and we were lucky. I went to Thunderbird Field and this is what Thunderbird Field looks like today. Uh, it took me many years to find out if this place was still around, and finally one day I did. I went over there. It's a field located uh, just north of the downtown Phoenix area. At that time, it was way out in the boonies. It's not anymore. It's in the middle of Phoenix now, and it was a wonderful field. In those days, the Army, all of the, to the best of my knowledge, all of the primary schools were uh, schools that had been civilian flight schools prior and they were put under contract and they flew several different aircraft. For us, we flew the Stearman, which we'll get a chance to look at out on the, on the floor. And it's a, a wonderful, wonderful airplane. Uh, still today, there are quite a few of them flying. And, and you look around here and you'll see them flying uh, people around for pay. Uh, you, I see one almost every day flying around my house, and he's carting somebody that's paid him fifty or hundred dollars or whatever it is for a, a flight around the valley in a in a Stearman. And we'll talk about that airplane and the PT-22, which has a local connection, a little bit later on as we get out into the hangar. Um, where we were de determined to a large extent what airplane you were going to fly in in primary. Uh, out on the west coast here, we had three, three primary uh, training areas, the west, the central, and the, and the east, and they were all in the southern part of the country. And this picture that you see here, that's a P, Fairchild PT-19, which was used a lot in the um, central portions and to some extent in the eastern portions in the primary flight schools. Uh, I know very little about the airplane other than that I have some friends that have flown it and they all loved it, thought it was a nice airplane. We'll talk about those as we get out in the hangar in, in just a little bit. I, I brought that picture in because it is the one major primary aircraft that we do not have here in the museum to show you. In primary, the greatest threat to completing the score, uh, course was not being able to solo in time, and it nearly got me. Uh, I won't go into that story because it takes quite a little while, except that I owe a debt of gratitude, a lifetime debt of gratitude to a tall, lanky Oklahoma pilot that talked so slowly I never knew what he was saying, who say, bailed me out and got me on my way, and from then on, I never had any problem, and wherever he is, I'm grateful to him. We were there for nine weeks, and in primary, your main 
uh, concern, as I said, the main purpose in it is to teach the pilots to get the airplane started, get it off the ground, get it back, do something with it, whatever you can do, get it back down safely, park it, and get it out without harming A, yourself, or B, the airplane. And that was it. We got 65 hours in it. And then we, when we completed, we went on to basic, basic flying school. In those days, the flying training program was in four parts, pre-flight, primary, basic, and advanced. Uh, and basic, I went to Minterfield, which is at, at um, Bakersfield, California, and Minterfield is still in operation on a very small scale. This is a picture of, of Minterfield, and this came out of my class book, which is why it has class 44B on there. Uh, those classes were numbered, first of all, by the year you were scheduled to graduate, and secondly, the letter was the month, B being February. Um, at that time, we didn't have an exact day, but we had a, a date. In, in basic, we flew this BT-13. Now, BT-13, after the war, there were a lot of these left around, and you could pick them up for a song. Um, they're extremely hard to find now. Uh, a lot of them, they'd yank the engines out and used them for crop dusters and things of that sort because they had a very good engine. The airplane itself left a little bit to be desired. But we were so dumb, so green, that we didn't know the difference. So we thought it was a great airplane. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, we lost some people in it. And that was the first experience I had with, with losing friends. There was quite a bit of difference as we stepped into the BT because, first of all, we now went into training that was conducted entirely by military people. All our instructors were, were military flight instructors and, and everybody up the rank, our academic instructors, everything was military. Much a Small base by today's standards, certainly small, uh, dedicated to one and one thing only, and that's teaching these people to, to do some of these things. Now we're more advanced. We're sitting in the, back, in the front seat instead of the back seat. We're uh, very beginning phases of, of formation flying, uh, instrument flying. We now have flaps on the aircraft. We have two-speed props. Everything is a little more complicated, a little, more, a little faster. It's a monoplane, uh, so your visibility is considerably better. And all of a sudden, you think that you're into a real fighter when, in fact, you're not. But it was a big thing. And one of the problems that I noticed as I went through <clears throat> basic, again, I was always in the back row, clear near the end. And one day, we were marching down to the flight line. And it suddenly dawned on me that there were not nearly as many people out there in front of me as there used to be. What the heck was going on? And, and we'd not paid it. We're, we're so involved with our, trying to get our own way through this that, that you don't give a lot of thought to a lot of other things. And it suddenly occurred to me that our flight was way smaller than it was a few weeks ago when we started out. By the time we came around to the point two weeks before we were to finish basic, in other words, seven weeks into that portion of it, we had washed out 65% of those people who started basic. Don't know why. Um, in many cases, they were the ones that we thought were doing the best. In many cases, they were, most cases, the squadron cadet officers were washed out. We don't know why, but all of a sudden they were gone. And that came to a halt about two weeks before we finished because it was at that point that we were asked to put in our preference for single engine or multi-engine advanced flying school. If you go to single engine, you're probably going to go to fighters. That's the aim at any rate, whether you actually end up there or not. If you go to multi-engine, you're almost assured of going either into bombers or transports. Some people wanted those, but not very many. Almost everybody was a budding fire, a fighter pilot. We put in that, and a week later they came down. A week before we were to finish, they called us in one at a time and gave us our assignments. 
And you could tell when they went out the side door at the end which guys were going to go to single engine and which were going to multi-engine. And, and I, that was one of the happiest days of my life when I, they handed me that thing and it was a set of orders to go to Luke Field for single engine pilot training. And right then and there, for the very first time in my training, I realized I was a well of a lot higher on the class rankings than I had ever guessed I was, because it went strictly by class ranking and preference. And about a week later, we climbed on that dusty old train again, and away we went back to the desert where we had just come from nine weeks earlier. Only this time we were going to Luke instead of Thunderbird. There, and there's only about, what, eight miles between the two of them. At Thunderbird, we flew, uh, I'm sorry, at Luke, we flew the AT-6, which is a marvelous airplane, and we'll cover that in detail when we get in the hangar. But when we got into that, now we're really learning to be fighter pilots. That's what we're going to do. The next step after this is to go into some kind of fighter training rather than uh, flight training. We had a little more instruments, a lot of formation. The first job the flight instructor had was to, he had, each flight instructor had four students, and his first job was to check out all four students solo in the airplane, because he can't do anything else until that's done. It took very little time. Most of the people soloed out in anywhere from three and a half to five hours. Uh, now we're in an airplane that now has a much more powerful engine, much faster, uh, much more complicated radios for the very first time, retractable gear. It's a, but most of all, they're starting to train us to be fighter pilots. Once the instructor got his four checked out, then the very, first, the very next thing he did was to form them up and start flying formation. We'd had a little bit of it, and we were not very good at it when we started. But everywhere we went, we went with a fl as a flight of four with the instructor in the back seat of the lead ship. Now, we got a little bit of time by, our, by ourselves, but not very much. And on all of a sudden, you could see the guys' skills at formation improve. Why is that important? Very important, because in combat, particularly in World War II, it was true, but it's still true today, a fighter pilot lives or dies mainly on two things, the speed of his airplane and his ability to fly good, tight formation under any circumstances. Because when you get into a dogfight and you're uh, going in on a gunnery pass, whether you like it or not, you're flying tight formation. And there's a guy sitting on your wing or you're sitting on his. And if you get out of formation, it'll probably be the last time you do that. It's very important. So they're developing these skills before we ever get into the big time aircraft. And they did a marvelous job of it. Then we spent about two weeks at Gila Bend Gunnery School. Uh, and later on, when we get into the fighter program, I'll show you how the gunnery worked. But that's where we learned uh, how to make gunnery passes, how to fire. And we got our first scores. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get out into the hangar with the uh, AT-6. And, and I can show you the things that we're talking about. While we're there, we were sometimes visited by some of our Navy people flying their frontline fighter. They would come in and visit us. And they would even go so far as to demonstrate carrier landings to us at times. As we approached the midpoint, of the training at, at Luke, it was time for the class of 44A to graduate. Their graduation came on the 7th of January of 1944. And you're going to see a movie later on on that exact class in their graduation at Luke. It's called A Fighter Pilot Story. It's a, a two-hour thing you're going to see about the first 30 to 35 minutes of it uh, because it tells the same thing. The man that, that, that this picture is taken from this movie 
His name is Quentin Annanson. I, he was my upperclassman. I, I followed him all the way through training program with one exception. When we went to basic, he went to Gardner Field, which is over at Taft, about 20 some odd miles further to the west from Minter Field where I went. And then we were back again at Luke. I didn't know him very well. I recognized his picture. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later on. Uh, but you'll enjoy that movie. Quentin tell, does a great job of it. But this is his class, 44A. <clears throat> and one of the honors when you're going through advanced in those days was to be selected to fly the AT6 flyover at the, at the graduation exercises for your upperclassmen. When you did that, there were going to be a 16-ship fly, flyby. And if you were selected from that, that meant that you were in about the top 25% of your class. Actually, a little bit about top 20%. If you got to fly solo on that, because each, uh, each element or flight of four would be led by a dual ship. If you got to fly one of the wing positions uh, or the number three slot, that puts you somewhere in the top 15% of your class, which did one thing for your confidence. It gave you a pretty good idea that maybe, just maybe, you'll get the aircraft of your choice when you graduate. Didn't always work, but at least you had a chance. And, and I was thrilled to death when the orders came down that not only was I going to get to fly in that, but I would be flying, excuse me, I got these out over here. But I would be flying a solo. And if you look up in this picture right here, and I think this is the, our class flying there, as nearly as I can make out. We're not really sure, but we think it is. If it is, you look up right behind that flagpole up there, and you can see, you can't see the fuselage. All you can see is a pair of wings on that number four aircraft. That's me. Uh, in other words, I was flying number four in the lead flight. By this time, we're beginning to think that maybe this dream is really, really going to come true. Something I'd been wanting for, you know, what? At least a third of my life, almost from the time I was old enough to realize what airplanes were really all about. And now it was drawing in a close and I was still hanging in there. And, and that did tremendous amount for my morale. And all of us felt that same way. The thing that we began to add up as we, we would sit in the barracks at night, and, and we did a lot of that at night. We flew all the time there. <clears throat> we flew, our squadron flew New Year's Eve. We flew Christmas Eve. The only reason we didn't fly Christmas Day and New Year's Day was because we were sleeping from having flown all night the night before. We flew all the time because we had to finish by the 8th of February. And we did. Most of us finished four or five days prior to that time. You were, but you never really felt confident that you were going to make it through. There was always that outside chance that something would happen. <clears throat> As it worked out, in, well, I'll go into this first and then come back to that. This is a picture about two weeks or so before, and I can't remember the exact time, but roughly two weeks before graduation, suddenly we were descended upon by this big tailor shop in Phoenix to measure all of us for our uniforms. And that was a day of deep thought. We, we were, this is, uh, if you look at this closely, these are some of my very best friends. And I'm just barely off to the right of this picture, uh, standing there in front of my butt. I don't remember them taking the picture, but I remember this occasion very well. Uh, the thought went through all of our minds, and we talked about it in the barracks after these people had gone by, uh, home. You know, I think we're going to graduate. I think we're going to graduate because I don't believe that they would give us 250 bucks a piece, which in those days was an enormous amount of money. 
and measure us and go through all of this rigmarole to fit us with uniforms and then wash us out. And I, think we, I still think we were right in figuring. We did, and as I look back on it, and here again, going back to what I said at the beginning of the class, every class was different. But I don't remember that we washed out anybody in advance at Luke. I don't think anywhere. Now, we lost some. We had two that were killed. We had one that flew on our nav night navigation and has never been heard from since. We have no idea where he went, what happened to him. He took off, and as far as anybody could tell, he went on the proper nav stream, and then we don't know. And so we lost three of our people, and they were all close friends. By that time, we were all close friends. Most of us had been together for a very long time, or at least in our young lives, it seemed like a very long time. So we did lose some, but we didn't wash any out. And, and that was a, a really a, an impressionable thing on us at that point. Not only because we hadn't washed out, but because it suddenly occurred to us that these instructors that have been working with us and beaten on us day and night really believed we had what they wanted. And that makes you feel good. On the 8th of February, 1944, the class of 44B rolled out for graduation. Through the years, I've taken a lot of courses and different things and graduated many, many times. This graduation is right up here, and number two is somewhere down there, and I can't quite reach it. This was probably the crowning point in my life as far as a real thrill. It was a crystal clear blue day, cold, nippy, as it sometimes gets in the desert in February. It had warmed up by graduation time. My parents had come down from a little town of Astoria, Oregon. The first trip my dad ever took in his life. And they came down on the train to watch my graduation. And it was a real thrill. It's hard to describe what goes on. Most people I know will not try. I will try. I will, I will not succeed, but I will try to pass on a little bit of that. There was so much going on that even we can't remember some of the periphery there. But they marched us in, the graduating class, in front, and we're now dressed in our brand new pinks and greens. Wearing our new rank. Most of us second lieutenants a few flight officers, and were seated in the first couple of rows, can't remember how many, and then one by one were called up on the stage and introduced to the audience, and you'll notice in the, in the uh, movie that Quentin says that his orders were given as they came off the stage. We already had ours at that time. We already knew where we were going. But they introduced us, and as the last man came down, the band struck up the Stars and Stripes Forever, and right at that time, 16 AT-6s from the class of 44C thundered overhead and disappeared out into the desert horizon. What a thrill that was. From there on out, it was just a jumble of faces and words that's hard to remember, a real thrill. We had made it, something that 
nobody can ever take away from us. And now, if you would, we'll take about a 10-minute break, and I'd like to meet you out in the Army hangar uh, by the Stearman. And we're going to talk about the airplanes. We flew a little bit there and, and let you find out what these things were really like. They're not quite like most people think. So let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll meet you out there. This is a Stearman aircraft that was used as a primary trainer throughout much of the country in the World War II. It was developed originally in about 1935, and it came in three different flavors. It came in the PT-13, the PT-17, which is the one you're looking at right here, and the PT-18. All three were almost identical except for the engine. They used Jacobs engines, uh, Lycoming engines, and this one had the Continental engine in it. Uh, all three engines were roughly 220 horsepower, and the airplane came, most of them in those days, with a wooden prop. This one is outfitted with a, with a metal prop, which some of them had towards the tail end, but most of them were wooden. Uh, it was, it's a biplane, and by that we mean it has two sets of wings, an upper and a lower, and they're braced and it, while it looks very, very fragile with all of these wires and the braces around here, the struts that hold it together, in fact, it's extremely strong. I've never seen one of these aircraft destroyed. I don't know how you do that. It's just that tough. Uh, they had requirements flying this airplane that you fly it right from the very first till the very end. As you can tell, it has very skinny gear on it, which made it prone to ground looping. Uh, by that, we mean you kind of lose directional control, particularly on landing. Uh, but it was not a treacherous thing by any means. It taught people to fly. It was an open cockpit airplane. And, you know, I once heard that described. Uh, I remember listening to somebody, one of the pilots, asked about flying with the open cockpit and he said well that's what we call really flying and i agree with it the open cockpit the wind in your hair that windshield that's way too small so the wind gets at you and you got your goggles on and that's really fun uh, the student always sat in the rear cockpit with the instructor in front and there were two reasons for that first of all if you look at the airplane you can see that the center of lift of that wing is almost directly underneath the front cockpit, which means that the center of gravity, whether there's anyone in that cockpit or not, is not going to change. Not true of that rear cockpit. It changes a lot. If you're going to fly with the rear cockpit uh, empty, no passengers, then you must put ballast in that seat or you will have an extremely nose-heavy aircraft. And that doesn't work well on these. It's very basic flying, and it's designed to do one thing and one thing only, and that's teach a person to fly. You need to remember that the students that were coming here to start flying these airplanes, most of them had never even been up close to an airplane before. This was an entirely new adventure to all of them. They had no idea what was expected of them or what kind of a thrill they were going to get. All they knew is that they wanted to be part of it. We had no electrical system whatsoever in the Stearman. It was started instead of by electrical start, as we normally think with almost anything nowadays, any engine. Up there was where the crank went, and it was cranked with cadet power. He got up here on this tire with his left foot and up on this stirrup right here with his right foot, and he started cranking that thing until he could no longer keep up with the flywheel. And then he jumped off and took the crank with him. This particular one has a T-handle there to engage that. There were some models where it was strung back there and it was engaged from either one of the cockpits. You pull that, then it worked just like a clutch in the old airplanes, uh, in the old cars, I'm sorry. And it engaged the, the starter to the flywheel and it turned the engine and at 116 degrees you didn't want to have to do that too many times. Fortunately I never saw one of these that failed to start the first time around. 
very reliable engines, very reliable airplane. As a result of not having any electrical system, we also have virtually no instruments in it. Most of the, the what did not require electricity were used in other aircraft anyway. Didn't need them here. We had three instruments in the, in the aircraft. Number one, we had an altimeter to tell us how high we were. We had an engine a tachometer to tell us the engine RPMs and to record the engine hours. And then we had another thing that we kind of laughingly referred to as a fuel gauge, and that was that thing right up there, hanging down from the top wing. And that told you either, yes, you have some fuel, or no, you don't have some fuel, or it beats the heck out of me, and this is a game, and you figure it out and usually it ran C. Uh, we paid no attention to them. They filled up when we took off and then they filled up again on the ground when we landed. Other than that, you had no airspeed indicator, anything of that sort. These were the airspeed indicators right here. And it was amazing for a bunch of, of guys that have, many of whom had never even been involved in music before, so they had not, no real innate sense of pitch, shall we say. And yet, in a matter of two or three flights, they would learn to fly airspeeds within one or two miles per hour just by listening to the pitch of the wind going through these wires right here. And while they don't look like wires, that's what they were referred to. They're braces of sorts. Excellent airplane to, f to fly. It was anything but docile, but it was stable and very forgiving wonderful acrobatic aircraft and I've always thought that it was more than just a mere coincidence that the majority of the fighter pilots that I ever met in in uh, World War II fighter pilots this is uh, in my career in the Air Force started with a steerman and perhaps that's why because very quickly it developed not only the ability to do acrobatics and rather violent maneuvers, but also a love for doing it. It was fun to do. And that was the kind of thing that fighter jocks live and breathe. One other very interesting thing about the Stearman that I almost forgot to tell you. Because it had no electric system whatsoever, it also had no communications, no intercom system between the instructor and the student who always sat in the back. Uh, therefore, they had to have some way for the get communications. The only thing they could do was a one-way communication. From that, they decided that they would do it the easy way. They bought three-inch funnels and some rubber tubing and stuck the rubber tubing on the small end of that funnel. It was rigged up in here. It went back into the rear cockpit. And once it got there, they put in a, a Y, much the same as what you see on a doctor's stethoscope. And the whole thing was similar to that and plugged into two little things on his helmet. Strictly a one-way conversation, which probably was a blessing at times because he couldn't hear what you were saying back. But every once in a while, if they got really irritated with it, they just took that funnel and stuck it out in the wind stream behind that prop. And he, he got your attention in a real big hurry. It was barely, barely satisfactory, but it did work. And, and again, necessity being the mother of invention. We could tell interesting stories about this airplane forever.